What's up, everybody? Welcome on into One Soccer Today here on OneSoccer.ca. Andy Petrillo, Gareth Wheeler, Oliver Platt, Jordan Wilson. The Canadian men, for the fourth straight time at the Gold Cup, are advancing out of the group stage. Gentlemen, they are going to the quarterfinals. John Herdman becomes the first coach to lead uh, his team to a third quarterfinal appearance. And they did so by defeating Cuba 4 to two. Uh, they needed a win. It was a must win situation. They also needed to score goals just to make sure in case that Guadalupe Guatemala game ended up being a high scoring draw. Uh, we'll get to that game in just a moment because it was bananas, but either way, the Canadians, they get the job done. Wheels, I'll start with you. Just overall thoughts on the uh, victory for the Canadians and how they looked. Much better. I thought it was very good. Um, look, the opponent wasn't great, but I was more concerned about how Canada would play. And on the balance of it, I think they there's two areas that they needed to improve in. They need to find some tempo and rhythm, uh, which I think they absolutely did in the game. They played, it was much more uh, visually pleasing, and you could tell that they were enjoying their football at times. And I think they got their tactics right. I think they got the right formation. They had proper players playing in different areas. It came off putting Liam Miller a little bit further up, playing Jonathan Osorio at least for the first half an hour higher up the field. Uh, and Ali Ahmed was excellent at left back as well, really providing that threat down the left-hand side that Lorea provides down the right-hand side. So I think there's lots of reason to be kind of pleased with the way that they play. And Canada, for, for their struggles at times over the course of the group stage, I don't think that they were as bad as advertised. They do have the second best XG um, per match in the Gold Cup so far. Only the United States is better. And their expected goals against is very good as well, considering they gave up two penalty goals uh, mm -hmm. over, over the course of the final game as well. So I, I think that Canada is okay. They're heading into this game against the United States just okay. Just uh, progress is being made here. Just okay. You're just bringing back some James Reimer, well, no. Toronto Maple Leafs memories here. Good. Uh, be good. <laughs> <laughs> Ollie gets that reference. So Ollie, I'll come to you next. Your <laughs> thoughts on that match? Uh, less optimistic than than Wheels, to be honest with you. I, I thought, Can well, I did think Canada were just okay, to be honest. Um, I, I don't think Cuba were very good. I think at two 0 I kind of expected Canada to to put their foot on that game and and, and run away with it. That. They were never really in danger, I don't think, of, of Cuba really getting back into the game, but it also didn't really happen, and, and they give up, end up giving up two goals. So, look, I, I think this tournament was always going to be a real challenge for Canada with the players that are unavailable. I think it was always going to be about, you know, trying a few different things, being a little bit experimental in some of the, the way they play, the players that are, are on the pitch, where the, those players are playing, and hoping that you could find something that kind of clicked that would allow you to make a little bit of a run in this tournament. I think going into the quarterfinal against the United States, that hasn't really happened yet. Uh, and yes, the Cuba game was better. But again, I think you have to account for, for the quality of the, the opponent when you're assessing that match. And I'm not sure we can go into that quarterfinal game against the United States with, with a ton of confidence right now. Um, you know, hopefully that, that there's enough there maybe for them to, to, to put together a game plan for this game that gives them a chance. But, but right now coming out of that group, uh, I, I think it feels like Canada is, is a bit more of an outsider going into this knockout stage than, than we, we probably ideally hoped. Jardo. Yeah. Just, uh, just to echo a certain couple of sentiments. It's, it's better than it was the start of the tournament last match, um, just because four goals are scored and they seemed like they had a little pep in their step, the Canadians, but then for me, the, the glaring issue is there are still two goals scored against them um, by Cuba and that being Guadalupe and the pony you're about to play um, has just scored. They just came off two 6-0 games and then have scored 13 goals in three games. And this is their, whatever you want to call it, spin it, their B team, C team. Cool. I just don't know if Canada has enough to, to nullify that going into this game and, and, and this and the, the players that they have within the squad, I'm looking at the midfield. I just think uh, it's still a bit green, still a bit fresh. Uh, in those type of games, you need guys to really be up for the task and, and be able to run extra and, and, and bully and, and be in the, in, in the ringer. And I don't know if they're, they're able to do that. So we're, we're going to see. I'm optimistic that it was a better match. But Debbie Downers yeah, I can't, all over the, like, I, I, know, thought, I thought I they, just, don't, don't you think that they actually got it right playing in a 4-4-2? I think do that agree that, with that is kind of what dictated the, the personnel. And Canada would have won this group if they didn't concede in the 93rd minute against Guadalupe. 
I think we all acknowledge like playing Guatemala in those conditions in, in that second game still hadn't got their formation right. Um, I think that that's understandable, but I do think that they leave the group stage on a high. And there's precedent here for, for the Canadian men doing well after drawing their first two games of a Gold Cup. It happened in the year 2000. You know, they, they played South Korea. I believe it was Costa Rica. They, they, they won like a, a coin flip to move on from the group stage. Then boom, they came out and beat Mexico that year. And look, I, I'm not saying that it's going to happen in this next game, but I think there's reason to believe much more after this last game against Cuba that they can really put up a fight with a proper structure um, and with players maybe feeling a little bit better about themselves now, building some confidence than we would have had ahead of time in that game. Again, it wasn't necessarily the final result. It was how Canada played that game, how they managed the match, and how they got a lot right in that game. And their underlying data and the underlying stats – don't reflect poorly upon Canada in the group stage as well. So I, I think that that the truth maybe lays somewhere in between some of the negativity, Andy, of these two gentlemen that are joining I mean, us. If, if we're clinging and, on to underlying stats, underlying stats, we play three games. Like I, I just don't really see. It. They, they don't mean a whole lot over that. Like sample, winning so. games is all that matters. They don't mean a whole lot. Data. No. Well, the, I mean, the, the data actually is used to kind of predict where the team can not, potentially not go. Data worth of three games. games. Why not? It's it's all we it's have. Too, it's to... not enough. It's not enough. Like I, I, people can talk about XG and stuff, and and I get it. Like it has its uses. It doesn't have use to me much. Much use at all in individual matches. I, doesn't I just it? Don't yeah, think but it paints a, it paints a picture of how the game was played. It's fine. It's fine if Maybe you don't want, if you want to ignore the data, Ollie. But the, the team has the second best expected goals in this tournament, and you can say that aside from conceding, you know, a couple cheap goals against Guadeloupe in their opener, and then two penalties. <laughs> against Cuba, look, look. Guatemala didn't really have any. I, I just, I don't think that they. I, I know that the expectations are sky high around this team, and I understand why. But I don't think that they've been as bad as many people are kind of painting the picture to be. And they have a big time step up in competition their next game, and we'll see how it plays out. I love it when you guys just argue because I can just sit here and enjoy. And then I don't know <laughs> why, but I'm just also noticing for the first time because I was able to sit back and observe. That shirt that Wheels is wearing, very Tiger-esque, and he is on the attack today. Uh, but, I mean, Wheels, you obviously said it. You love, you like the 4-4-2 formation. Uh, Jordo, do you like that as well? Do you feel like that's what Herdman should go to? And, and I mean, obviously having a little bit more of a break here between uh, playing their final group stage game, now they're getting ready for the quarterfinal, which will be on July 9th Sunday, so they have uh, a break. Does he go with the same lineup? What are your thoughts on yep. that formation and lineup? For sure. I think he goes with the 4-4-2, and I agree with Wheels in the fact that it was better. I just think you were playing a Cuban side that just wasn't good. But in terms of stability, that's what that 4-4-2 provided. I think when you play a 3-5-2, we, we talked about a bit, Andy, in the, in the pregame, it's more of a crossing type of, of system, right? You need your wingbacks to get forward and, and get balls into the box. And I just don't know if the Canadian team really functions that way. Well, this Canadian team. Um, the 4 for 2 just allowed stability and allowed players to maybe 1v1 to just just make the difference that they need. I think also when you're going against the Americans, playing that 4 for 2 system just allows you to be a bit more compact. When you're playing a 3-5-2, there's always like an in-between spot, right? Like, oh, do I go and press this guy? Do I run out? You see sometimes with Vittorio when he has to play in the middle, he's like, do I pop out? If he does, there's a huge hole in the back line. I think a 4 for 2 just provides structure and everyone knows okay this is my area this is my zone this is what i need to do and i think going against americans that know how to score i think that's the best way to to go into that game how you feeling ollie yeah I, I thought what it did was it simplified the the attacking roles of some key players like azorio or at least in the beginning of the game when he was playing further forwards liam miller was much better i think in that role further up hoyler you know again just just more of a straightforward ask of him in, in a wing position um, as opposed to playing as that kind of second striker as he had done in the first few games. So I'm, I'm not tied to 4-4-2. Like, I think they need to pick the team to play the US and, and win that game, and that might look a little bit different. But I think what they did for the Cuba game specifically had the key effect of, of, again, simplifying what they were asking of some of their attacking players, produced more chances, more comfort in those positions. Um, and that was a positive. Uh, th there was still some things in there as well that, you know, worry me. Um Going into matches against higher quality opponents, I think the midfield is is still a real concern. I actually thought, even though Bombito himself was not having a very good game, I thought when they had Bombito and Fraser in central midfields, 
the team had more control over the game because of that kind of structure than they had had at any point in this tournament so far. Um, and so I don't know what Herdman is going to do there necessarily because I don't know that Bambito, again, as an individual, is, looks hugely comfortable there. He does seem to be, obviously be more of a natural defender. But then who do you pair with Liam Fraser if, if it's not Bombito? I think that's still a real question mark for this team going into into this U.S. game. So that's one I'll be really interested to see what Herdman does. Yeah, well, yeah, that's that's the one big call in the team is how to replace yeah. Bombito if, he, if he's not going to go back to him. Looks a little bit raw. That's okay. Like, I still think that he has a lot of potential to be very good. But, you know, going into a game like this, I think John might lean on experience. It wouldn't surprise me, Ollie, if he pairs Jonathan Osorio. With, with him in that role and Jaden Nelson played well, or you could bring in Schaffelberg or play someone else across the left-hand side or Liam Miller can drop back and you can add another kind of attacking player to play underneath. I think there's multiple options here. If you go back to three at the back, Ali Ahmed and Richie Larea need to be your fullbacks and they're going to have a big role. I think the conditions, the weather will have a big, a big role to play in this, but you know, you, you mentioned the midfield. This is why John Herdman was pursuing Aiden Morris so heavily a player that's yeah. now playing for the United States started the first game against Jamaica came off the bench in the second game didn't play in the third game Morris wouldn't come off the field if he was if he was playing for Canada but I will say this Liam Fraser the best game I've ever seen him play was Canada two United States nil in 2019 he came into the game 14 minutes in for an injured Mark Anthony K and he played an incredible game of football and I thought he played really well in the last game as well. His distribution is great. I think like in that system, he can absolutely thrive. So let's see. I mean, this American midfield, James Sands, Georgie Mihailovic, like, I don't know. Like, I, I think it's an area that's going to be critical for Canada to be, to be competitive in that game, in, the, in those battles. Sonora's left the U.S. men's national team as well. So, so we'll see what that position looks like. Uh, for, for the United States come that game, you know, you're not dealing with like Tyler Adams and Weston McKinney in this game. You're dealing with different players. So I think that Canada are right there for the fight. And I do like the improvements that they made. So would you say the wheels, I mean, how are you feeling with Canada going up against the United States? We obviously had our thoughts with them going up against uh, USA and CONCACAF Nations League in that final. And I think a lot of people felt very confident given what they were able to do against the United States and World Cup qualifying. But based on that result, and just based on everything you've seen as well at, at this tournament, would you say the Canadians are a bigger underdog here? Well, they're, they're most certainly an underdog, you know, playing the United States in the United States, a place that they haven't won since 1957. But forget about ancient history. Let's <laughs> deal with recent history. Jesus Ferreira and Brendan Vasquez are two excellent attacking players. I'm not even looking at the name. The Nations League does not matter. A lot of these players are completely different um, I think for some of the Canada players who've carried over, they'll remember this moment and the hurt of this moment. Herdman likes to call it a derby match. It's as close as the national team will come to having one. So there's a, some experience in this Canadian side. And I look at them to rise to the challenge, but you got to deal with Ferreira. He scored back-to-back -back hat tricks. I know not against very good teams in, in, in Trinidad, Tobago and, and, and St. Kitts, but uh, Vasquez is like, you know, just as good Robinson Reynolds in the back. Turner's the one carryover from this U S team from the nation's league to uh, the gold cup, I guess, miles Robinson as well, but he was injured for the yeah. Canada game. So uh, those are just the only two players in this U S team. Look, they're very good. I liken them to being an MLS all-star team and that's no sign of disrespect because these are some of the best players that play domestically or some players that are just launching their careers overseas in Europe. It's a very good team. It's going to be a big test, but Canada just needs to rise to the challenge, play within themselves. And they have some players in this team that are capable of springing an upset as well. How are you feeling Jordan compared to nation's league final and now this quarterfinal matchup? So nation's league final, I was saying that Canada was an underdog, I think on their day when they play good football, they're, yeah, a bit below the United States, but they could compete with them. I think that just how the tournament's been and the players that played so many minutes, and I don't want to be disrespectful, say lack of depth, but there's just, they're green on the bench. They're, they're not used to maybe these type of battles and these type of games. Um, I would say the underdogs going into this game. Now, I've also said that the ball is round. It can roll any way. This is what my dad said when I was a kid. I said anything could happen. But I also think that when you go into a game like this, you're required to do a bit more, specifically in the midfield. 
I think people have to accept maybe you're not going to have the ball the same way. Maybe you're not going to have time on the ball the same way. If it's Frazier or Bombito or Frazier or Zorio or Bombito or Zorio, whoever uh, John Herbin picks for those two, they have to accept that they're going to suffer a bit today. Also, defenders. It's like, yeah, everyone wants to make passes out of the back and have the game comfortable, but it could be a dogfight. It probably will be a dogfight. So I think having that underdog mentality could really help the Canadians going into this game. If you really say, look, this is one game we can beat the Americans. Let's roll up our sleeves. Let's let's stay in it. And then I do think Canada have some X factors that could change the game. I think if Horlitz on it, Miller really showed like what he can do. And we've asked of that. We've asked that of him in this tournament to show what you're capable of. I think he's he's doing that. You saw the best of him the last match. So we do have some ace cards to play. Um, but it's just about suffering and, and getting into those moments and, and knowing that you're gonna you're gonna bleed and you're gonna run a little bit more than you probably would. Yeah. I'm with Jordan in a lot of ways on that. Like I I think they are undoubtedly bigger underdogs in this game than they were in the Nations League final. You know, at full strength now, I think Canada feels like and obviously it didn't pan out in that final. But Canada feels like they can go toe to toe with anyone in this region and, and take the game to them on their best day. I, I don't think you can feel like that going into this quarter final. It's going to be about, like Jordan said, embracing that underdog role, making the US's life difficult, making the game difficult for them in terms of the things that they like to do, and, and then trying to trying to catch them the other way with with some of the difference makers that Canada does have. So um, it's going to be really difficult. I, I think Jordan touched on a, a, a good point in particular when it comes to Canada's bench. That, that to me, you know, as, as the game gets later on and legs start to tire is, is going to be a bit of a concern, even if your initial game plan is, is working well. Um, there's going to be a lot that has to go for them, I think, in, in this match. So it's, it's going to be tough, but you embrace that underdog role and, and maybe you can make their life difficult. Just, just remember, there's a lot of familiarity here. Like Ferrer and Vasquez, they go up against players like Miller and McGraw every week in Major League Soccer. Like the, the a lot of these players know each other because they play on a regular basis in league play. So I think familiarity sometimes can be uh, to the advantage of the underdog a little bit in situations mm -hmm. like this. So we'll see. We will, because I, I'd love to know what the XG and then, you know, what the eye test also tells us about the Americans, because this is a very, very strong team, even though they've had to tap into their depth.